Welcome to the Between Two Wheels podcast, where we talk about all things on and between two wheels. I'm your host, Johnny Roblock, and you all know my co-host, Justin, the battle donkey is finally done, bird, Ooh. and uncle, no new bike, Ken. Today's episode is being <clears throat> sponsored by Get Lowered Cycles, your home for Harley parts, accessories, and all the gear you could possibly need for your bike. Today, we are discussing dollars. Both Harley and Indian see sales slump, while Americans own more bikes than ever before. Huh. So what's going on, guys? You didn't capitalize Americans? God damn it. Well, Justin wrote that. Son what? of a bitch. Yeah, you wrote that. Oh, I think I copy and pasted that, so. Oh. So yeah. someone, someone else didn't write someone Americans correctly. <laughs> <laughs> I point the finger like I always do. <laughs> yeah, when in doubt, blame someone else. Yep. So what's going on? Uh, the battle donkey is done. That's good. Living the dream? I know yeah. I am. Yeah? Yeah. I don't, even I, without a new bike? Even yeah, well see I, I spent all that money that I could have put like towards my bike on rifle parts. That's hunting good. hunting stuff. Unacceptable. Hunting stuff, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, cool. What well, what'd you get instead of bike parts? Go so to. I got a three hundred blackout upper for uh-huh. my AR. I got me a night vision scope. Uh for those night hunts you do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So Terrors come at night, man. Do that, man. I think that'd be so fun. I'd be scared shitless out there in the dark. Yeah. But That's why you got a fucking big ass gun <laughs> <laughs> and night vision? Yeah. Let's do it. I think uh, it'd make great content regardless. <laughs> all right. So we're talking about dollars here. So financials come out. So excited! I said come out. Financials <laughs> came out for Harley Davidson and Polaris. And for anyone who does not know, Polaris is the parent company of Indian Motorcycles. Yep. So, Justin, let's have you kick off with Harley. So, no news here, but Harley Davidson saw double digit sales slump in America during Q4 of 2018. Oh, <gasps> go figure. <laughs> that is its eighth consecutive drop in sales for the American market. God damn. Eight consecutive quarters? Uh, yes. Eight okay. consecutive quarters, yes. Okay. Uh, they are down, well, this one they barely gotten a double digits they are down at 10.1 percent from q4 of 2017 so year over year they had a slump correct okay uh international sales are down 2.6 percent making a worldwide sales downturn of 6.7 percent uh looking over at the stock market which i mean us as bikers i'm sure we are all about the stock market oh yeah i got all them <laughs> stocks and bonds uh harley stock is down eight percent since 2009 now Ooh. roblox i know you you dip more way more into the stock market than i do what is a downturn of eight percent over the course of 10 years that's nothing that's well, pretty pretty, yeah, well, pretty little so you have to also look at from 2009 they were still trying to recover when the entire stock market took a crash oh yeah, yeah that was pretty much in the middle of the recession wasn't it yeah yep uh, that was at the, the tail, tail end, end of yeah. the very beginning yeah. of the recession so it, it's going to take time for them to bounce back up but i think the the main issue here when we whenever anyone brings up stocks it's analysts who are telling the market you need to go out and so harley davidson you need to make x millions of dollars per quarter if you want to stay up with what wall street says you should do yeah but here's the thing and i and i'm i hope more and more people realize this people who sell stock and buy stock for a living so all the traders out there they don't make money unless the average joes like us buy and sell stock that's why you pay a commission every time you make a trade in the buy or sell side Mm. so they want people to get apprehensive and start selling off their stock why because they make money off of it it. they they set a price point they're saying okay we think the earnings per share are going to be four dollars and 85 cents a lot of the time the we'll call them the bookmakers are pretty close but when there's something unique that happens let's say president trump goes on this tariff craze and starts costing harley davidson more money on aluminum or they he does something to piss off europe and europe raises tariffs now harley davidson's coming out of pocket 
that's going to shift numbers. Yeah. Regardless of what party does it. Any, exactly. any type of, I just wanted to clear that up because mm-hmm. the way you said that, I, I could see some people getting very upset. But anything that affects trade, regardless, if it's a good thing or bad thing, yeah. it's going to cause change. It's going to cause right. people to, oh, like yeah. you said, either buy or sell. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, and every president has done it for that matter. Yeah. yeah. So whenever we're looking at stocks, I don't, I don't care. I had to sell all my stock I had in Harley from when I worked there because of my new job. I didn't want to. I've held that stock for almost a decade and had no plans on ever selling it. Mm -hmm. They still pay out a dividend. So they're doing something right. Yep. Yeah. I think last year they paid out $3 for the year in dividend. So that's per share. That's per share, though. Yeah, that can be a lot of money. So if a company is still providing a dividend, they're still showing a profit that's a good thing that's that's those are your basics they're not giving up yet yeah they, they, sure. they haven't died yeah and something else to go along with these numbers the sales are down 10.1 percent but they made 13,000 fewer bikes yeah in 2018 and they still had higher revenues yeah so that tells me that at least harley davidson has gotten their pricing mix right sell fewer bikes and make more money and that's not even, I mean, you have to take into account regarding the, the revenue aspect is with, I don't think that the industry has seen as big of a change regarding the amount of R&D because up until, I don't know, 10, 15, maybe 20 years ago, it was all, how do we make these internal combustion engines more powerful, more efficient, lighter, easier to work on? That was probably their main focus points. Well, yeah. Now you've got a whole new wrench thrown in with EVs. Yeah. And, yep. you know, we hear about the news of them buying these EV companies typically months after it's already happened. Oh, yeah. Which, by the way, they just bought uh, Stasic, that little push bike that we saw at Waco. Oh, yeah. They officially have uh, bought that company. Yes. Nice. So they, you they, will see a Harley branded stay sick. Yeah. Pretty close. Man, $10,000. That'd be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Same range as the live wire. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was talking to, uh, I'm not going to name names, but somebody at uh, our local dealership, they already have deposits for three live wires. No shit. Yep. Because I was asking, when am I going to get a test ride one? Of course. Not for a while. Yeah. Which uh, they already have their charging station put in. Nice. And oh, they were right breaking on. it. Took them like four and a half days to get. So that that's what they in. were pouring the concrete for. Okay. Yeah, yeah it's going to be right there uh, where they park the test ride bikes. It's going to be yeah. in the island off there, yeah, yeah. just okay. outside the front door. Yep. Cool. Good spot for it. So there is now two. I at least know two Harley charging stations in San Antonio. I haven't heard of Havelina. I know. Well, I'm guessing if Green's not doing it, Havelina's not going to do it. No. Either. Yeah. So. We'll see. We already we are already seeing some some divide within the dealerships on if they're going to support this or not. Well, you'd be able to charge your Tesla there then, right? Maybe. Yeah. Should be the same, same charger. It should be it's universal. The same charger, but yeah. is the plug the same? Yeah, it should all yeah, be should universal. Be all okay. universal. Okay. That's one, it's one thing Harley didn't fucking make proprietary. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that that would have been a stupid <laughs> mistake. That's like so that's like having buy an a, adapter. You have to have an adapter to fill up your gas tank. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Apple would do that. You have to buy oh. a separate dongle to, to fill up your <laughs> bike. <laughs> Thank yeah. God Apple doesn't make, make motorcycles. <laughs> oh. Anyways, back to the topic. But yeah. I don't think the industry. Uh, going back to my original point, the R and D costs are going up exponentially for any motorcycle company that's going to want to stay competitive within the EV market. And I think it'd be stupid not to especially for anybody that sells bikes outside of America. Now, if you're only selling to the American market, we're not going to be as affected as anybody within the EU or Mm -hmm. in that area. But I was doing some research just completely on a separate topic today, and the EU is already cracking down on the emission stuff. Oh, yeah. And it's getting worse. Their latest meeting, they found out that the EU is actually going up in carbon emissions, so they're going to have to cut down more to reach their target goal by 2024, I think is what it was. Yeah. I'd, so I'd, they're about to even impose even more regulations. I'd read an article, it was like last year, and they were kicking around the ideas over in the EU of banning vehicles beyond a certain age. Yep. 
and that's still that's still on target. So they're still talking about that, and they're imposing even heavier regulations on anything made after uh, or after the regulations go out. So, so like, it's funny because in Europe, it's a complete paradigm shift, if you will. Gasoline over in Europe is so expensive compared to diesel. Oh yeah. Whereas here it's flipped. Gas is yeah. cheap, diesel is expensive. Yep. And I can speak to England. More and more cars over there have diesel because mm-hmm. it has lower emissions. It's funny that you mentioned that. Sorry to cut you off, yeah. but diesel is actually contributing to more carbon output than gas is over in the EU. Really? Oh, that could be because it's more diesel. Engines. Exactly. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. That's that's what I was. So I was they're trading to. off one evil for another evil. Yep. Yeah. Okay. You're having you're having to put more cars out to reach that evil, but the end game is still the same. Sure. Yeah. I think sixty. I want to say sixty four, sixty seven, somewhere in that area was from diesel motors. Hmm. That's funny. I remember when diesel was cheaper than gas here in the states. I do. Yeah. I remember that too. I mean, diesel is a, a byproduct of making gas. Yep. Yeah, but yeah out of, they have a supply and demand situation where the, your largest demands over the road trucking, and they know they can get the money for it because yeah. people are shippers are going to have to pay it no matter what. Oh yeah, I mean trucks take a percentage, a very small percentage of total diesel mm-hmm. intake. You know, it's funny. You know who the number one is as far as diesel mm-hmm. intake? Trains. Yep, Union Pacific Railroad is number one, followed by the United States Navy. Well, yeah. Goddamn Navy. <laughs> hey, not, every, every, not everything can run on a nuclear power plant. Yeah. Please try harder. <laughs> try harder. <laughs> okay, so I dove into the financials for Harley, and I, I picked out a little nugget that I think you guys are going to like. Harley claims that their bikes, and this is a direct quote, continue to generally command a premium price at retail relative to competitors' motorcycles. The company emphasizes remarkable styling, customization, innovation, sound, quality, and reliability. Now, if they are using those benchmarks to command a higher price, we can see why their sales are dropping. Yeah, I I agree. I think the only thing within that whole statement that was I mean, obviously true was the price or relative to competitors in the American market. We've, we've done an episode on comparing mm-hmm. them to Indian, pretty much the same. Right. But anything after that, I have to agree, kind of call them BS on. Yeah. So let's start with styling. In oh the boy. style department, <laughs> the only new style we saw last year was in the form of the FXDR. Oh, yeah. Which looks like they took some spare V-Rod parts, some rocker parts, and Dyna parts, married them together on a soft tail, a soft tail frame, and then called it a new bike. Uh, their and, styling and, is outdated, period. Well, and people shredded the styling of the FXDR. Well, <laughs> well, to be fair, to be people, fair, to be fair. <laughs> 2019 was kind of a, a down year as far as that, because the 2018 brought us all of the quote unquote new soft tails, which we did. I think everyone can agree the most drastic that we saw was the Fat Bob. Yeah. Completely something new. I think the Fat Bob is the only bike that has checked that that the styling, styling to, to kind of push it forward and it's so funny because you i mean we all we all saw the comments people fucking hated that headlight they hated everything about the fat bob but now a year later and they love yeah, it. it's a pretty fucking dope mm. bike yeah. <laughs> well, people, yeah well you know they they base all these opinions off of first impressions yeah of seeing a rendering of a bike mm-hmm. which Harley, don't get me wrong. Their their photography department takes good pictures. I just don't think they capture the styling of the bike well because all three of us said the exact same thing when we saw the FXDR, mm-hmm. and it's it looks so much better in person. Oh, absolutely! It, it does. doesn't look great. No, oh, yeah. But well, compared to the pictures, it looks so much better. If they changed out the air box from the factory, that that air box yeah. is fucking hideous. That thing that kills it for me. That and I don't like low slung bikes. And that the FXDR is a very low slung bike. You yeah, sit. but I mean, a lot of people do. Yeah, I mean that's why you see the breakout and the fat boy. A lot of people like those. Yes, yeah. I, I will say I've every almost every FXDR I've seen here in Texas has mm-hmm. been owned by an MC rider. Yeah, something huh. fast, nimble. <laughs> yeah, oh, they're, they're definitely yeah. fast as fuck. They yeah. are fast. They are quick. Yes, like, I, I'm telling you, I took a test ride on one, and I can. Spin that tire in first, second, and third. Yeah. With my 300 pound ass on it. Yeah. So if we go back to styling for one second, 
in my opinion, the non-touring Indian bikes have more style to them than the Harley bikes. Uh, in general. In gen- I wouldn't say it's it's exponentially better. I would, I would say, say if we look at the Scout versus the Sportster, I think the Scout just looks like a cooler bike. It's something I, I would want I, to yeah. Especially in their motors. Yeah. Their oh, motors look yeah. so well, I'd say much it looks better. like a more modern bike even. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. You know, the Sportsters still look like fucking the Sportsters from yep. 30 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that, I mean... <laughs> They base a lot of that stuff on tradition, but I think that's only going to keep them afloat for so long. And and you know and I yeah and exactly and I understand tradition helps carry a company, but so does innovation. So does innovation. Yep. <laughs> you can still keep you know your classic styling. Yeah. You know, in in, in parts and pieces, and and have you know, a phenomenal bike with lots yeah. of technology in it. Agreed. So let's move on to customization. Now, if it wasn't for the aftermarket, their customization would be in the tank. Absolutely, 100% period. agree. Uh, HD accessories are tired, boring, and overpriced. So oh, yeah. overpriced. Well, and and, <laughs> and they're uh, I want to I want to say they underperform as well, just generally. I yeah. mean, there's a few parts, but I, I don't go to HD for my uh, any of my accessories. Anything. So I do like their new Dominator. I think it's what's called series. The Dominion. Dominion. Dominion, yeah. Dominion series. I do like that copper look. And I'm I wish they would actually make it for the damn touring models more than just the fucking grips. But I've I've heard that they are thinking about coming out with more stuff. But I do like that look and I can't find that at that price point anywhere else. Yeah. So for me that that's okay. Some of the style points, if you will, come into their aftermarket accessories, but I don't know. I think that is going to kind of some things that we touched on last episode is because you could buy parts and have them powder code that 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 color anywhere. Mm -hmm. But that's going back to the someone has the dollars. They just want to pay it. They want to pay someone in the back to do it and have a bike that's quote unquote unique. Yeah. So let's talk about the aftermarket. I personally like Advan Black and Zero 3D just two quick brands that produce high quality parts that's that kind of competes with the price point of harley Mm -hmm. now i just recently and this is why i brought up advin black i wanted a tour pack and lower fairings for the road glide special to buy those from harley was going to cost me 1800 plus oh yeah and i'd have to get it color matched yep so that's going to be another 500 five five to six yeah five well we go five to a thousand we're talking paint yeah so I was able to go to Advan Black, and it's coming from China, but folks, most of Harley's parts and accessories are coming from China as well. Yep. But the quality, I mean, Justin, you were there when I was putting it together. It's identical. Oh, you, yeah. You could literally put two, you could put the Advan Black and the Harley parts side by side, and I would have had to look at them for probably a good 10, 15 minutes before I found even the tiniest little thing that would have put it off. Yeah. There, I mean, 90... 8.7 percent accurate oh yeah they're great the color matching is stupid good yeah so i have a bonneville salt pearl and the paint was dead on it is spot on and i am a stickler for that kind of stuff and it is they nailed it yeah and 1300 bucks shipped to my door and, and ready to go and that came with this custom stitch liner that looks it's freaking awesome so i think awesome you and I both, Justin, have mm-hmm. liners from them, different colors, high quality, and they just get, awesome. They get so many compliments, too. I had it open at the shop the other day. Man, it caught everybody's eye. It changes everything. Yeah. yeah. Especially I mean, when it's, because like on mine, it's orange and black, yep. which kind of goes along with the orange pinstriping on my bike. Yep. Yours is black and red. Correct. And just, it pops. It looks like the inside of a luxury automobile. Yeah. 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 And yeah. that's what it feels like, too. So the same quality parts painted to match and delivered to my door. And I did have to put it together, which I mean, big fucking kind whoop. of expected, really. Yeah, it's coming from China. But the packaging, it took oh, me it was great packaging. 30 oh, fucking man. minutes just to get all of the protection <laughs> off of it. Yeah. So they take their time. Oh, yeah. And those like, boxes were quadruple ply. Yeah. 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 That's expensive boxes. <laughs> yeah. So all this and it's 500 plus the cost of paint cheaper. Yep. Oh, yeah. That that tells you that Harley-Davidson's 
overselling or overpricing their accessories there. Zero 3D, I just recently put on their frame mounted highway peg things. Yeah. Love them. I'm talking to you guys about them earlier today. I absolutely love these things. The ones I got from Harley two years ago, I took those off of my crash bar and all the powder coat starts chipping off. Yeah. Uh, I would expect that if I bought them off of Amazon and paid $20 for yeah. them. But these are $100 mounts that I was going to put on Tracy's bike and crapped out. So for me, I, I can't stand that. So I think you're you're overpaying for subpar product. Well, and, and just a really small selection. Yeah. I mean, you, you go to... In comparison to the rest of the market, yeah, yeah, they hold a very small portion of it. So Harley touts their custom customizability, but in reality, it's not theirs. No. It's the entire aftermarket. You look at a JP Cycles catalog just for Harley, and it's a thousand plus pages. Yep. And it's none of it's from Harley. It's from everyone else. Oh, so yeah. Companies like Arlen Ness, Ciro. Oh, my, one of my favorites, Kiryakin. Kiryakin. Yep. I mean, I it's hit or miss for me with Kiryakin because their chrome plastic doesn't doesn't suit me well. But I do know they have some amazing products. Oh yeah, I'm, I love I their floorboards. Them. Yeah. Uh, so, um, so let's go to innovation. Now I'm I'm an asshole about this one. So where's the <laughs> Just innovation? About this. Yeah. Well, <laughs> where's the innovation? And if you don't ride a touring bike, what innovation is a rider getting? They can't rest on the fact that they, uh, they're still running an air-cooled V-twin anymore because that's, that's an old technology now. There's no innovation there other than the fact that they're still making it work. But that's not innovative. They've already figured that out 40 years ago. Yeah. Um, their power-to-weight ratio is lacking behind Indian and behind all the European brands. So, throttle by wire? Well, they just I mean, got to the soft tails last year. Yep. Yeah. So, it took them way too long. It's been on ATVs for years. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. So, no, not there. So, <laughs> Except I'm, for the Sportsters. Yeah, the Sportsters I mean, well, don't they, have it. Well, they brought in, what, have the hydraulic clutches? Okay. Ooh. Yeah. Ooh. Just on well, the touring bikes, though. Welcome to the game. Yeah. <laughs> so, I... I'm I'm just curious to see where the innovation's coming from. Livewire, don't get me fucking started on that. It's been in the works for ten years, and it still lacks in range. Well, it's ten year old technology now. Well, yeah, yeah 130 miles to the charge on, on a good day. <laughs> yeah, in the city, no highway riding. Yeah, yeah. So, what are we seeing there? I think their innovation is a joke on the Livewire. Uh, with smaller companies with lower R and D budgets, building longer lasting, lower cost EV bikes. So, what yep. are we getting in innovation other than the infotainment? I think really the only thing that I can see on the live wire specifically is the whole subscription based thing, kind of like the the OnStar for the bike, which is kind of cool. But it's like, but is that innovative? Because again, you have OnStar, you have you connect on Chrysler vehicles. Yeah, but we're not seeing it on bikes yet, so. Uh, like I said, you get, it's take really, it with a grain of salt, but it's innovation that we don't want. Yeah. And it's just more yeah. money. Because I mean, you get it free for a year, and then you start paying for it. And what do you get for that? It tells you, like, the life um, of your battery. It tells, you, yeah, tells you what charge you're at. So, like, for example, if you ride to Starbucks and plug your bike in, you can sit inside and sip on your mocha and grande latte ball sack, and it'll tell you when your bike's done. Uh, it also has, I think, like, low jack style stuff. Uh, it'll tell you if your bike's getting messed with. <laughs> it's, it's So everything an alarm system would do for you. Essentially. Yeah, pretty okay, much. Minus the whole, you know, knowing when your bike's charged. But it's like, okay. Can I just walk has, over my bike? Has and it been like six hours it? yet? <laughs> do they not have, like, a green light type of thing on the charger itself? Tells I don't you think you're so. Full? I don't think, or at least the ones I've seen, it's, like, this big. Oh, so you actually so, have to walk out to the bike. Fuel yeah. gauge. <laughs> Yeah, so, so I mean, eh. any other innovation? I'm trying to think back to like the soft. I mean, the Milwaukee Eight was innovative because it was partially oil cooled. They did switch to a single cam system. Um, well, they went back to a single cam true. system. Yep. Back to a single it's, cam. It's a very similar motor to the Evo, just bigger and more powerful. Oh, the counterbalanced there, right? Counterbalanced. Well, um, the, the twin cam was counterbalanced. Ooh. Four spark plugs instead of two. Yeah. Oh, hot damn! So they upgraded the heads essentially yeah so but 
all of these things Honda has been doing yeah, for years. Yeah, all been done before. Yamaha's been doing, BMW's been doing, uh, even fucking Ducati has been doing it. So there's nothing innovative there other than the fact that it's new to Harley. Yep. Yeah. Yep, I agreed 100%. It's like when Grandpa gets hold of an iPad. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, my God, look at this. <laughs> it's the Facebook. Have you seen <laughs> these people's on here? How'd they get them in there? He's Start moving, sharing articles. These moving are, pictures are amazing. Nowhere near true. That's my dad. Good God. <laughs> and then let's... the other. I, there's two more items on here. Sound. Bullshit. No. Complete <laughs> bullshit. Harley's sound comes from their aftermarket... All the aftermarket systems. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, yes, they they have a patent or whatever the hell on the tuning of their exhaust note. But in reality, you don't hear it no, you until know. you throw aftermarket pipes and, and headers on there. To be fair, that's that's a lot of government <sighs> stuff, though. They can only do so much. Well, I agree. Well, but, up until recently. But you remember on the Evos, the, the world-renowned Harley sound, the potato, 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 potato. That was Harley sound. Yeah. Now it sounds like uh, a sewing machine. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> and you, I mean, yes, I get that the EPA restricts the shit and has Harley by the balls, but they can still tune an exhaust to sound good. That's Even true. their aftermarket pipes, the Screaming Eagle pipes, don't sound as good no. as the nope. true aftermarket exhaust systems. Yep. So I'm going to call bullshit on that one because. Unless you put a header that takes the restrictions off, and I know Californians don't have the option to do this because of their California EPA or CARB. I get that. But the rest of us in, in America, we have the option to change this out, and that's when we get the true sound of a Harley. And it, it does sound good, but I don't buy a Harley because of the sound. No. So Not at all. Now, quality and reliability... I, I will say that both of these are on par with the BMWs, the Hondas, the and the Indians. Regardless of the reputation. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean... <laughs> Regardless I of what you hear from other people. Yeah. Well, the, well, people are basing, you know, all that off of... The shovel head. Yeah. And the pan 30 heads. and 40 years ago, yep. <laughs> back when AMF took over and we're putting out fucking shit products. Yep. Yeah. So I just feel that... We're telling, you know, Harley is telling themselves and investors a line of bullshit to make them feel better about selling a $10,000 motorcycle for seventeen grand. Now, as for their sales dropping, their primary new market, millennials, simply can't afford a high-end motorcycle. Hey. Not, not just Harley, but any brand. And there's one root cause from this. Student debt. Yeah, it's a big part of it. I mean, I, I would love to see the amount of student debt in like the 80s compared to now. There I wasn't bet it's like student 400%. debt back then. Well, that's just it. The market for student loans didn't happen until the mid to late 90s. Oh, well. That's there when that go. market started taking off. And that's when schools went from, you know, twelve, thirteen hundred dollars $1,300 a semester to four, five, ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 a semester. Yep. Because the federal government said, let there be. FSA or what's it called? FSA loan, student loan, federal whatever. spending act, Something. whatever it is. Yeah. But yeah, all these stupid loans that kids can't afford. Oh yeah, with horrible interest rates, dude. They are ridiculous. And what's, what what freaks me out over those is one of my ex coworkers. He was talking about how his wife, like, if you depending on, of course, every place you get it from is different and everyone's situation is different but with her situation she got a promotion at work granted she works as a government contractor so i don't know if this has anything to do with it but when she bumped up a level her student loans also changed yeah it's almost like child support in, yeah. a, in a way that like the more you make the more you have to pay on them yep and I'm like, that is just insane. I think, imagine if that was a car. Like, <laughs> you put out a five five year note in a car, and it's like a year into it, you, you get know, a new job. You get a, a five thousand dollar raise, a five thousand dollar raise, and all of a sudden your your car payment doubles. It's like, what? <laughs> yep. But yep. you still have you know four years left on the loan. Like your your time doesn't shrink because it's all going to interest. So it's like absolutely. Yeah. I just, I don't know. To kind of close out my piece on this, um, <laughs> Harley still thinks they're a luxury premium brand, and they're not. No. They no. simply aren't. You look at Harley-Davidson versus, let's say, BMW. 
let's say Ducati, both of those are made by luxury brand companies. Audi makes Ducati. BMW is BMW. Yep. Known luxury brands. Their bikes are still less expensive than Harley Davidson. Yep. And there's an import tax on their bikes. Oh, yeah. And it's still cheaper than Harley. So I'm going to get off my very high soapbox here and <laughs> give Ken a try. <laughs> Uh, I mean, with Harley, I just they're, they're just lying to themselves, all right? They they just don't think, they think their shit don't stink. Yeah. yeah. They're, they make quality products. I enjoy them. They, they, they have a name that they're living with, that they've lived on, all right? But that name can't carry you forever. No. And l- like you said... You can get similar bikes at a cheaper price that's going to do all the same stuff that you want. You know, to that point, I think Shade Tree said it best in the interview. People base their personality on their Harley Davidson. A lot of people do, yeah. Yep. So who who is Justin all about? He pointed at your Harley. That's what I'm about. And I think that's what's keeping Harley afloat right now. Agreed. It's that it's the image. Yeah. You know, I mean, like I said, Harley thinks their shit don't stink and it's just, it does. It's starting to at least. Yeah. You can say that. Yeah. Okay. Justin. I'm going to, I mean, you guys took a lot of good points, but I'm just going to bring up, (laughs) I'll bring up kind of the, the point that I brought up a few episodes back is the time of oh, I ride a Harley because my daddy rode a Harley is is coming to an end because, I mean, look at my last car purchase. My family has always been a GM family. I think we've had a couple Ford sprinkled throughout, whatever. But when I went to to look at cars, I, I told myself, I was like, I'm going to level the playing field. I'm going to go test drive every single car, compare the pros and cons, and buy whichever one I like. The name didn't mean shit to me. But you now, still ended up with a GM. It just so happened. <laughs> and I we, we talked about that before. It just so happened I did land on a GM, but that came down to, if anything, this proves this point because the reason I chose the GM is because it was cheaper. It was a cheaper horsepower ratio, horsepower to comfort ratio, I guess I should say, as far as you know the infotainment system and all that, than any other car that I wanted. And that's... I mean, Fair enough. I think you're going to start seeing people, you know, shift over like, oh, I want a motorcycle. OK, well, what are the pros and cons of this, 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 this and this? And yep. like like we did the 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 road glide killer mm-hmm. on paper. Those other bikes destroyed Harley. Sure. And but we still chose Harley. Yep. I mean, yes, but <laughs> I'm going to actually tout a something that we talked about is the only reason that I go Harley continually is because I like to build bikes. Yeah. I, I, customize, could, I could not customize, customize a, yeah. a BMW the way I could my Harley. Oh, no. No. I mean, you could paint it yeah. really cool. It would be a, it would be a struggle, and I, I think I, I would I think, like it. I but. think the BMW aftermarket is about one one-thousandth of the Harley. Let's see. There you go. And that right there is my reasoning behind it. Yeah. I'll pay that extra little Harley tax just so I can actually turn it into something unique not thrap throw some some harley parts on it and you know some some little fraily things on the some tassels on the other handlebars <laughs> and say i'm an individual but really tear down the bike and and make it my own just not something i can do with another brand sure all right so let's take a break and hear from our sponsors several bad puns later all right so we're back and we're Shifting over to the other American motorcycle company, let's talk about Indian. So, oh boy. Justin, you, you started us off on the Harley side. Let's let's talk Indian. Go ahead. So, Indian gets a lot more muddy. It's a lot harder to get numbers on Indian because they are owned by Polaris, which owns a lot of different companies. I didn't realize how many they they owned until Roblox took a little bit deeper dive into it, but they own not only... Polaris, Indian, but they also own a bunch of um, like uh, off-road aftermarket companies like ProComp, four-wheel parts, things like that. And they even have some boat companies in there as well. You said the largest boat company in the The largest US? pontoon manufacturer in the United States is owned by Polaris. Yeah. I think so it's U.S. Boats. So, I mean, 
all of this stuff is is kind of speculation. There's not a lot of hard numbers we can base it off of. Um, we got a or we didn't get a quote, but we got a quote from another person who got a quote that said they saw a uh, high teens digit sales decline for the quarter compared to the same period in 2017. Um, that was just for the motorcycles division, though, which, of course, I, I have to say, of course, does that include the slingshot? Or yes. Do, okay. Yeah, so yeah. the slingshot, so is slingshot being, and Indian are combined on all of the financials from in, uh, from Polaris. Gotcha. Okay. And then we were able to dive down a little bit deeper in that and that the slingshot sales alone tanked in the sales into the mid 30s percent compared to Q4 of 2017. So, why is that? Do you think that the sales struggled because everyone who wants a slingshot already has one except Roblox? Hey, I, I, I still want one. I do. <laughs> Have you seen the guy that, that lives in your neighborhood who has the actual full roof and it's all connected with Dude, metal there's, bars there's and then he has a full race there, helmet there's three of them in this neighborhood <laughs> be safe but the, the one you're talking about the dude has twin turbocharger on it oh god yeah because they run off of cobalt motors. yeah yeah chevy cobalt and, gm and they, and they have no power unless you do that oh yeah they're 1.6 liter i think yes yeah, something like, yeah. Something like yeah. that <laughs> yeah, my, my so, harley has a bigger motor than that car yeah <laughs> so i mean i kind of have to agree with it i think anyone who wants one already has one uh, I I don't see a market for them. It, it's an it's it's another niche market, especially for how expensive they are. <laughs> but oh, it's yeah. it's a niche market that fits in with Polaris's markets. That's true. You think so? Yeah, because you look at all the, the, the ATVs and the side by side UTVs. You see, that's all like off road, you know, off road fun or off road work sure, stuff. But those it's same use people every day. would want to get a slingshot. And go rip it up and have that freedom, but without being on a motorcycle. I mean, well, it's a side by side for the road. Is literally what it is. Yeah. Well, you know, maybe they need to make like an all wheel drive version. Throw some some mud tires on there. Bro, well, it's kind of like um, I would break some shit. <laughs> oh, I would too. Oh, what's that so brand? The, the, the spider. spider. The yeah. spider has that off road version yes. of that, and, uh, and it's I, dope. I, yeah, I'll actually take that over a, a slingshot. <laughs> oh, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we I have thought, silence. I thought we were taking it over, but okay. Um, going back, uh, the gross profit margin for Polaris motorcycles is down a whopping 56%. So that's sales, not total numbers. My biggest question is, uh, the you know, the big elephant in the room for Indian. If they ever fucking get them out, like we're, we're what, 12 months into this release oh, yeah. and I still haven't seen one on the road. Will the FTR save Indian from this sales slump? So, can you want to take this one? Sure. I, I don't think, I don't think that one product is going to save a company. Okay, it it can. It has the potential, mm -hmm. but I, I really don't see it doing that. And then they put out shit like that. You know, the Roadmaster Flex Gold Balls shit fucker. <laughs> The for Roadmaster 40, Elite. For $40,000, it's got gold flake inlay in it. Nobody fucking cares. But they sold every one of them. But, but, and that's exactly my point, <laughs> is they're going to sell out, and because it'll be one of those, just that the Roadmaster Elite, it was an, one of those niche things. I want to have something that's elite, mm -hmm. and they'll sell all of them. I hope that the FTR brings in a bigger crowd, and I hope that it brings new life to Indian, but I, I'm, you know, I, they're, how's the saying go? Don't count your chickens. Don't count your eggs or whatever. Don't count yeah. your chickens before they hatch. Yeah. There you go. Whatever. Just, you know, they're putting a lot. They're putting in, a lot of eggs in that basket for yeah. sure. Yep. Yeah. But All sitting on that FTR and it's a dope looking bike. It's it awesome. Is, it's a killer looking bike for a niche market. You think True. so? I don't, I don't, I don't think it's as niche as, as like the slingshot. No, 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 no. no, no. But what bike does the FTR actually compare to? Uh, the FXDR comes to mind. Mm. But it's not the same class. You're right, but that's just what I thought of. That's They kind of feel the same, you mm. know, the, all that power and go. and. It, I mean, I would on say paper, like, it'd be the Street Series, but that's not even a fair comparison. I would say the Fat Bob probably has the most comparable as far as engine size and... 
hmm. seating position and riding style. Riding style, yeah. Okay. For me, I don't think I don't think anything's actually happening to Indian in a bad way. They're up to ten percent market share in five years. The American market, they own ten percent of it. Now Harley's just shy of fifty percent. So that's actually a good place to be. Ten percent market share Compared against to, Harley. Yeah. But I have to ask, how much of that came from taking out one of the competitors? Or eliminating one of the competitors? What, with victory? The victory. Let's let's be hmm. real. I don't think they Polaris had all of that combined under market share. Okay. So it was their motorcycles. They had 10% of the market share. Back then they had, I think, 7%. Okay. So So they dumped one line that wasn't selling very well. They put some style and some R&D into Indian, and now they've regained everything that they lost from victory plus some. So I'm going to say it actually helped them considerably. But one thing that Polaris has going for it, and yes, Indian reaps the benefit of this, is the fact that that's only like 9% of Polaris is Indian. Yeah. It's a gigantic company. But all their R&D dollars is spread out. So Indian has this massive bank of money they can go and build something like the FTR that is different. It's unique. They can take a chance, take that risk. And if they sell every model they make, they're going to reap the benefit from it. So they also, they also have the benefit to uh, the word that comes to mind is cross contaminate. So like if, if you find a new technology in the off-road industry, you can slap that into maybe like a dual sport or something like that. Mm -hmm. Something, I mean, I think that's where they have the biggest advantage. So I think, I don't think Indians hurting. Yes, sales were down, but sales were down across the entire U.S. market oh, yeah. for motorcycles. So yeah, no one's you know raking in the big bucks. No, so everybody else down. I do, I do find it interesting that Indian took less of a hit if you look at dollar for dollar than Harley did. That's that's interesting yeah. considering it's one-fifth of the market share but their their revenues percentage-wise did not take as big of a hit as harley did i think that goes right back down to r&d like you mentioned because they're able to to pull it from other places when harley is literally floating by itself yeah not only that but their their r&d costs are probably up substantially (laughs) for for the ev stuff all right so let's move into American households having more motorcycles. Yeah, so Yay. we're going to go from people aren't buying motorcycles to people are buying more motorcycles. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But this is a well, these are this is a good junction. Yeah. Yes. Harley, Indian, all the companies they had a huge sales boom right after their Great Recession because money was cheap. Yep. So a lot of people went out and bought new bikes they're refinancing their homes taking money out and now it's 10 years they're not riding these things so the used market's flooded oh yeah Yeah. so eight percent of american households have a motorcycle that's insane just think about that number eight yeah one in eight people that you know yeah Mm. and that's and that's up from 6.94 percent just five years ago so, I mean, yeah. So there's a big jump, but yeah, the the pre-owned market's what three times larger than the three new market. Three times larger, three hundred percent. Wow, Jesus! So, and, and Harley needs to embrace that. Yeah, but they How? have they have by creating better financial services products for the used market. Yeah, they're the dealerships are actually doing a lot better job of marketing their used bikes. Mm-hmm. And they're getting more incentives from the motor company to sell those bikes. Because on the dollar for dollar side, Harley can sell an extended warranty on a used bike, Mm -hmm. make the money up there. But they're not selling new bikes. So they're looking stagnant. And the motor company doesn't get any money when a dealership sells a used bike, Mm. unless they sell that warranty or they get the financing through Harley Davidson Financial Services. 
Or if they do the whole writer to writer swap yeah. thing, which that's just them getting their their thumb in the pie there. They get three yeah. percent. Yeah, that's what it comes down to. They get three percent on this on the uh, financing. Yeah. So I don't know. The, the the stat on this article that made me very happy is half of the homes within that 8% have multiple bikes. That's impressive. Now, my question is, is that, because it, it, it says the amount of homes. So it doesn't say per person. So does that mean more women are riding? I mean, we've talked about that before. Well, and, and that's going to be hard to judge. So if you look at your house and my house mm-hmm. there's two motorcycles registered to each address yep yep but at my house one is being primarily ridden by tracy and the other one's being primarily ridden by me at your house they're both ridden by you correct yeah so trying to figure out that number is harder but we do know from previous episodes the number of women riders has skyrocketed over the yeah. last decade. Oh, yeah. I would like to just dive into that stat. Not only is it a woman-owned or women-ridden bike, is it two bikes for the same person? Is it one project bike and one new bike? Is it one Harley and one Ducati? Like, are people... I mean, I, I know a lot of people that are d- diving into more of the... I mean, I was it for a while. I had the Triumph and the Harley. And yeah, you had a Speed Triple? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, it's. I would I would really like more information on that stat. So, if if you wrote this article and you're listening to the podcast, please. <laughs> <laughs> it's from thedrive dot com. All right. I do find it interesting, and we'll wrap this up. But I find it interesting that experts are claiming that motorcycle motorcycling is dying in the U.S. Even though now. There's more households with motorcycles than ever before. I don't know where they're getting that from. I really don't because, I mean, we we reviewed the article of the amount of licensed riders Mm -hmm. is up substantially. The amount of homes that have a bike are up substantially. The amount of women that are riding are up substantially. The amount of minorities who are riding is up substantially. So where does it... I don't understand where it's coming from. (laughs) False claims. Fake news. Fake news. Fake news. It's huge. 